Um, so the format of this evening is, is um, we just try to describe it as a sort of lecture format. So you have got Olivia and I as uh, Friends Quarterly editors hosting the evening. And we have with us tonight two of the authors from the last edition, which I hope you've seen a copy of. And that's Judith we have with us and Deborah. And they will talk about some of their thoughts and reflections that fed into their articles. And I know it would be normal practice to have a, a beautiful long opening period of worship, but because it is literally a 60 minute drive-through event in this sense, we will have about 30 seconds of Quaker quiet to enable our speakers to ground themselves, after which Olivia will start the process. The invitation is to you to put any questions you may have for our speakers in the chat space. So if we, we gather ourselves together, friends. Well, welcome all. Thank you so much for coming along tonight. Um, as Jill said, uh, she and I are the co-editors of French Quarterly, and our latest edition was on the theme of good governance, um, thinking about that in the Quaker context particularly. Um, it was a theme we found that lots of people wanted to hear about, like many of yourselves tonight, uh, but not so many people had the time or energy to actually do that writing about. So we were very lucky that Judith and Deborah did give up their time for that, and we're very grateful for them. And I want to start with both of you, and I'll, I'll aim this at uh, Judith first, because this is really something you touched on, particularly in your article. Um, you, you talk a lot about how basically we need to communicate better to people what governance is and, and why we do it and kind of explain it better and ultimately teach it better. So I guess the kind of key question there is how would you teach governance skills? And, and I guess linked to that, how would you communicate what governance is and how to do it well to friends older than you and once you've spoken to the feel free to pop in with any thoughts you had Deborah as well. I think already um, Quakers have plenty of opportunity once they are part of some committee or invited to a role there's lots of support and help to understand the role and uh, what it means and how to to do things. But I think there's a stage before that, and that is a much more general understanding of how we organize ourselves, because that's what governance is about. It's basically how we organize ourselves so that we can achieve the loving purposes of God. So I would want to make sure that there were lots of opportunities for us to talk to people about, quite informally, but about not just what we do, because you can sort of pick that up by a strange process of osmosis, um, you know, and you can copy what people do. But the bit that's missing, and I get quite passionate about, is why? What's the spiritual underpinning for all this stuff? Um, sometimes our practices to people coming new to us are very peculiar. But they're not peculiar once you understand their, their spiritual basis. So formal teaching is good, but if everybody took every chance that they had to talk to people about how we organise ourselves and why we do things in the way that we do, I think this would be enormously helpful. We might find that people would be more willing to take part in it but if it feels something you know strange and difficult and remote from them um, they're not likely to to do it so that's the, that's my little soapbox the thing I'd really <laughs> really like to get across and to have happen that lots of people um, understood more about the spiritual underpinning of it all I don't know whether that answers the question adequately. <laughs> well, I certainly think it's very useful. And I think the whole idea you're making coming down to is just talking to each other. 
and just making it very clear and very a very open conversation with each other and that's kind of how that knowledge gets passed on and how the responsibility gets shared out I guess ultimately and I don't know if you have any thoughts about this Deborah and sort of how you think we could teach governance um, I, I think that conversation is often the best way of, of people meeting one another and, and talking about why things are the way they are. Um, do a little plug for Woodbrook, um, since we're on a Woodbrook um, <laughs> thing uh, forum here, um, that Woodbrook has developed a lot of these sort of one day courses and much less sort of something just for elders or something just for treasurers of kind of understanding um you know what the what being a quaker and taking a quaker role is all about and i think that's um that's important the other thing that i'd like to say is um when i've talked to people not just quakers but outsiders about well when i was on quaker stewardship committee for example people actually really got it you know, kind of understood that all organisations have to organise themselves and that they, you know, that trusteeship and things like that have to happen. And so, um, you know, I think that, uh, as, as Judith said, there is the spiritual underpinning. But I think, um, you know, the fact that we organise ourselves, but also that we can have, I was going to say fun doing it, but I, 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 we do have fun because we, because whatever we do, we're working in a group and getting to know one another, um, you know, and sometimes struggling with some, you know, nitty gritty things, which may be um, not particularly interesting in themselves. But what's interesting about them and good about them is how you get two or three people working on it together and you think, oh, yes. You know they've brought remembered something that i've forgotten or they've brought in an aspect that i hadn't thought of and that's you know that to me is what is what builds us up as a community is how we get to know one another um so you know and that's the start of it and then understanding the spirituality of it um can't be done by osmosis but i think in a way has to be done by experiencing it and and um being part of a meeting that does um in the middle of a discussion uh, you know about the finances suddenly realize that there's something really fundamental here and seeks in uh, sinks into a silence that's deepened and out of which uh, perhaps perhaps a new uh, understanding grows and so i think it's about how we work together as much as as about a process that's sort of you know as, as I tried to say in my article it's not about rules and regulations it's about the the quote from um, um, Ma uh, Patricia Loring about the fluid life of our of our society uh, that, that uh, interconnectedness and so on Well, thank you so much for both of you. Uh, we have actually had a couple of comments um, in our chat and do feel free anyone watching today to put any questions or comments you have in the chat space as well. Um, and it is kind of related, um, but you know, one friend is asking sort of how we can uh, address, and it's very similar I think to what you said, but I wonder if there's anything more you might add to it, where he expresses a concern about how difficult it is to involve friends and government of any sort. Um, and how the horizons of their kind of uh, their Quaker work, their government work, end at the front door of their meeting house on a Sunday morning, mm -hmm. and isn't kind of carried out in in any other part of their life. Uh, and then the other concern was about how few friends, um, even people who are attending business meetings and perhaps are getting more involved, uh, are maybe not as familiar with church discipline as we would hope. And I don't know if you would come down uh, back to that point about conversation being the way of tackling that, or if there is anything else. You, I don't even know if it's like a leaflet campaign we need to be running here or something to kind of say, what, what are the main structures or processes that we operate by? I hope that makes sense. Do let me know if not. <laughs> yes, I think one of the things that um, is clear to me that no one way of doing this helping people to learn about it is going to be by itself adequate there will need to be lots of different ways and for some people you hand them a book uh, for other people you direct them to a, a video or you direct them to a, a blog or um, 
a person that they might uh, talk to uh, or leaflets. You need all these tools um, so that, but you also need the courage to tell people, <laughs> you know, we shy away from this idea of teaching people, um, but sometimes we're doing them a disservice by not teaching them because they can't get fully involved in things if they don't understand how we do things. They'll feel excluded. They'll feel on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, and we just need to be much braver about talking about it. And I'm glad uh, Deborah mentioned enjoyment because yeah. yes, being on governance um, committees can be hard work, but it can be enormous fun. And the sense of doing something useful for the society to which you belong and which you love, and that's not too strong a word, um, that, that gives enormous satisfaction and doing it with other people. So we just need to be much more upfront about this um, and, and talk to people, but have the backup of a whole lot of different ways of helping people to understand. I don't know whether that goes a little further to answer that. Your question. I'd, I'd like to bring in the, the idea of simplification, which, um, mm. you know, the, there were a series of workshops last year that Britain Early Meeting uh, trustees were doing um, in, in order for us to think differently a little bit about Quaker work and that, yes, there are some some jobs for which continuity and long service is, you know, absolutely vitally important. But actually, there's an awful lot of shorter term jobs of um, you know, maybe just producing a leaflet for a particular event or, um, you know, looking at, um, you know, you may have somebody who's got expertise in health and safety who can just help on something which they know about and, and as can, as Judith said, contribute to the life of the society from the knowledge that they have. That's, you know, and the kind of bite-sized pieces to get people involved um, to me is a good way rather than sort of say, would you like to serve as a trustee for six years when somebody <laughs> just come through the door? It's not the way to go, but to get people, you know, and I think that there needs to be, you know, I haven't looked at the thing, but, that, you know, people with busy lives, actually people say, yes, I can see that over the next fortnight, I could look at your draft health and safety documents and see whether it makes sense to me. Um, you know, it's a kind of a, a way of doing it. And I think, um, you know, so I'd like to add that. That, but uh, maybe want to go on to something different. No, no, I think that was a really helpful addition, Deborah. I think uh, it was something you mentioned, I think, in your article as well, actually, Deborah, about sort of, you know, both the drop of water joining the river. And you said something the other day about sort of how, you know, you've only got to bring your own little droplet. That's all we each need to bring. You know, you don't have to bring the whole river, the whole lake, the whole ocean, just your little droplet. And all of that flowing together will make that whole body of water, which I thought was a really kind of useful way of thinking about it, and a bit more manageable, and that's overwhelming. Because uh, as you say, the prospect of you know five, six years on a committee or as a trustee can be a bit daunting, I think, for anyone. Um, and I guess that actually kind of picks up on something that um, another friend has kind of commented here, where you have both spoken about how much joy and fun can actually be found in governance, much as we may not expect it to be. Um, but I think there's something about trust, so trusting in the process, trusting in the people you're working with to take these decisions and kind of be led by the spirit together. Um, and I have a friend here who said, um, I have some concern that right ordering in Quaker practices and processes seem to be shared through conversation and historical established ways, but then that can mean that it's possible for things to be asserted as this is proper pro uh, Quaker process in ways that disempower others from querying things or even taking part. These things may work well when there's a real trusting relationship, but what happens when there's any sort of dispute or tension? And that was actually another question um, I wanted to ask, so I'll, I'll link them if, if I may, about, because you, you do mention trust in your relationship, uh, in your article, sorry, and I guess linking to that, what, so one, what do you do and what happens when there is any dispute or tension and to what other warning signs that there is that tension or lack of trust there? And how do we manage that? That is quite a lot. <laughs> you can take a moment to think it over. <laughs> I, 
I think trust is about communication and is about relationships, um, all of which, um, you know, take time um, to build. And um, so it's, it, <laughs> if you know somebody well, it's easier to trust them. And it's also easy to trust them if they say, what's going on here? I don't agree with that. Uh, you know, if you know that you know them well, you listen to them carefully when they say, um, you know, things don't seem to be going quite the way I expected. So that I think it's important to listen to the, uh, those voices as well. Um, and of course, the other thing, of course, the other side of that is the person that you find it hard to agree with, let's put it that way, also has those nuggets <laughs> of truth and to work out, you know, when absolutely on the ball um you know is also important so i think i think communication open communication um you know being uh, to say um you know what particular aspect of this are you worried about can we can we talk can we explain something um you know can we listen most importantly i mean communication to me is first and foremost listening to what somebody is saying um I was, um, one of the things that I was reminded of this morning, um, we were talking about discernment in, uh, we've got our, we have a little um, short period of worship and somebody was saying how glad she had been that we were able to actually meet in person on, su on Sunday and have our business meeting and that for her had felt much more real. And so we were talking about what it was, uh, you know, what discernment was, which of course is, you know, it, it's very hard as Judith said halfway through her article, you know, I haven't got to the bottom of it yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and often we recognise, you know, that turning point when we see it, when something is uh, turning from something quite mundane to realising that there are spiritual things. Um, one of the books that I turned to um, this morning uh, to remind myself, and I know she's here, is, is Joycelyn Dawes' book um, called Discernment and Inner Knowing, uh, and which has got a lovely acrostic by um, Vera Dalton, um, which talks about the different stages of discernment, one of which is gathering information, but one of which is about feeling. Um, and sometimes when an issue comes up and you're feeling a lack of trust there, uh, you know, sometimes it's about something which is actually not related to the topic, uh, but is pr pressing your buttons in some way, um, you know, that, that somehow is sending alarm bells and trying to separate out, why am I feeling so, you know, why is this disturbing me so much? Sometimes, of course, it is for very good reasons, but actually sometimes, um, you know, it, there's something going on that's either in yourself, you know, that there's some something that's happened in the past that's that's disturbed you and why, you know, somebody who presents something. And um, so I think there's that sort of thing of kind of being aware of um, of our feelings, our thoughts, um, you know, and, you know, what has happened before. So I think it's, uh, discernment is not a, just a one-off thing. And um, if you get the chance to read that book and, and find that little um, chart, it talks about quite often weight, you know, which of course is the Quaker process, you know, which is either wait in silence for a few minutes to see, what, you know, whether there's somebody else that needs to say something, or, or, you know, if you can, to present information and wait before you have to make a decision, perhaps at the next meeting. I feel like that's, yeah, a really good thought to bear in mind and something I think is quite if we often feel we're quite good at waiting, but it is hard. But I think one of the kind of cruxes you both touched on there essentially is about community building and kind of building, you know, groups that trust each other and that sometimes is just turning up and just being present in the spaces that you're in whether that's a Quaker meeting or another kind of group or or a governance kind of position but I don't know I wonder if that could also extend to just creating community in other ways like having shared lunches together like having they bond on this together who knows that brings a bit of fun too I reckon I think trust is so 
slow building and can be destroyed very rapidly. And when that happens, one needs the courage to ask other people, well, about what they're feeling and not get so caught up in one's own feelings that we become deaf to what is going on in other people. Um, I think too, and this is what I remind myself about when I am feeling critical of other people's discernment and other people's contributions, um, that they too have access to the guidance of the spirit, exactly as I do. And think it possible, you may be mistaken, it's one of my favorite <laughs> <laughs> um, bits from Advice of Series. Because very often, it's not that you need to change your mind, but you need to change your heart. And you need to put yourself in the position of the other person who is having a problem with you or you're having a problem with them or there's some kind of, of difficulty. And I love that bit in Faith and Practice, which talks about which the, from the Young Friends Conference, um, where they were all, all from Quakers from all over the world with very different approaches and very different um, understandings and they were getting nowhere and then at the final meeting one person suddenly was urged to say I know that for some friends here the doctrine of atonement is very important and there's nothing in the uh, epistle which speaks to that and suddenly that humble, trustful contribution changed the whole atmosphere and they were able to find some sort of unity. And that is a story that encourages me enormously because we're bound to come up against people we don't get on with readily and easily. We're bound to come up against situations that look insoluble. Um, we're bound to come across situations which hurt us and prevent our trusting and listening. So to have that story uppermost in my mind, um, I find very comforting and strengthening when things are, uh, are difficult. And I have to admit to finding the most difficult thing, trusting the discernment of other people when they take decisions that I wouldn't have <laughs> wanted. And I wasn't there at the meeting. <laughs> that is stupid of me because it doesn't matter who is at the meeting if what everybody is trying to do is find the spirit-led way forward. Um, you know, finding the decision, it's not about satisfying the participants, it's about finding the right thing to be doing that's going to produce the fruits of the spirit, that's going to unite us, that's going to empower us to go forward and to work. Thank you, Judith. Um, which has a, a neat segue to one of the comments that's come in here. Um, this is about a local meeting that invites newcomers to business meetings without bothering about whether or not they are members. And I can see the beauty of the inclusion and the diversity that that encourages. It also provides a challenge, does it not, in that we're saying that if you're present in a business meeting, you are part of that discernment process, but people could be present without being clear about what discernment looks and feels like so you know we would have to work our way through that I guess I mean I love the openness of it it's how do we help people be discerning rather than um well I, I use the phrase you know when when I'm sitting in a business meeting you know I have to be careful it's not my will it's thy will that we're looking for we're looking for that spiritual imperative um and how do we model that for, for newcomers because you know we're not always well disciplined um, in business meetings are we so <laughs> we create the problem ourselves I think sometimes <laughs> um, yeah it's that faithful worship and including other people's 
inspired views so that we get to something rich and meaningful for us as a community. Um, and I think this is, relates to another comment that there was about, you know, newcomers just want to hear about worship. How can we make governance interesting? Um, and given that our governance happens through worship, it shouldn't be that <laughs> difficult, but I will let you phrase how you might do that make it as exciting as worship itself <laughs> because it is worship i mean there isn't any division i get really upset when people talk about boring business bits and spiritual matters as if they were two divorced things <laughs> mm -hmm. you know if we really and truly understand that the whole of life is sacramental it doesn't matter what we're doing we can tap into the, the, the spirit. We can get guidance from the spirit and we need it for goodness sake. Um, and trying to, I mean, I, I wish people would stop talking about business meetings and talk about meeting for worship, for church affairs or for business, because that emphasizes that it's a meeting for worship. And if people understand it's a meeting for worship, and they've been worshipping with us, they will know some of the underlying um, discipline and spiritual underpinning of it without anybody having to spell it out for them, uh, in, particularly. Um, and it is about, you know, the, the way that we do our business is about building up our community, building up our work and witness, um, so that everything that we do is speaking of who we are and what we value, what we think is important. And that means that if you have to spend a bit of time over the colour of the carpet <laughs> in the meeting house, um, um, we had such a thing in Exeter. And uh, in the end, um, our dear friend Jim Putz brought a piece of carpet and said, this is what we should use. And everyone thankfully said, whew, good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, but so, so humor can come into um, into um, meetings. They don't need to be. They don't need to be solemn, but they do need to be serious about everything that we do. Let our lives speak. Everything that we do is important um, for helping people to understand what it is to be a Quaker. Uh, uh, Thank you, Deborah. I don't know if you yes. want to follow up. I think so. I, I, I was telling uh, Olivia and uh, Jill and uh, Judith when we were talking earlier uh, th this week about um, that I was in Governance Tastic Week in that I got um, area meeting, local meeting, and um, the trustee body meeting of Friends in Wales that I'm involved in all happening in the week. Um, and th thinking about our local meeting that I referred to that uh, somebody had really enjoyed, uh, which was a, ce a celebration because we were able to be together for the first time that we'd had a business meeting in person and not on Zoom. And, and the main part of the business was about how we were going to be together, um, you know, for the, f for the next period, um, you know, coming out of COVID. And it was really important that we were hearing people's views, um, you know, so we'd done a consultation uh, by phone and email and so on. And those people, everybody was able to express their view beforehand. But halfway through the meeting, um, there, were, uh, there was exactly the situation that Jill said. There was somebody who only attended. This was his second meeting that he'd attended with us. And he did what I think most people would do the first time that they'd come. He was sitting mum and somebody else said, oh, I'd like to know what Nigel thinks, you know. And, you know, and it wasn't a clerk or anything. You know, it was, you know, well, Nigel's sitting very quiet and, he, and you know, and he was able to express himself. And, and that's, the, uh, uh, we're a small group. And so um, we're perhaps more informal than some. But, and the other thing I think about, um, about a, a meeting for business is um, trying to work out, well, you know, anybody who's been on any, any committee, whether it is to work out 
what actually needs the time? And this was the thing that needed the time. And recording who'd attended area meeting on our behalf for all of those things, we were able to do by printed draft minutes that people had had in advance so that we didn't need to, um, you know, well, we're going to take that item, we record that so-and-so was at the area meeting, but we didn't need to go into it. And, and I think it's that thing of sort of, you know, which obviously requires... Um, preparation and clerking beforehand so to have got you know what do we need to discuss together and, and prioritizing the time and of course as you go along you know you're also learning about governance you're lurking, learning about a decision that was made about um, you know and obviously we were also thinking about our risk assessment because you know if we if we're meeting in slightly different ways you know how are we going to manage with the coffee cups and all of that kind of thing you know, so that and, and I think that, again, you know, COVID has made people very, very aware that these are decisions that we need to be aware of. They're not something that some group somewhere else makes decisions about that we need to be aware of. And if you like, buy into and understand. So I, I think it's that sort of governance sounds as if it's sort of something that's outside ourselves, but about how we meet and where we arrange the chairs and, you know, and who will make the tea and you know and where the fire escapes are are, are all kind of vital um, for our meeting places and and we are very very thankful that somebody has got us a template you know that we can just work through and kind of ask the right questions and make sure that we've addressed those questions um you know and and that so that we can you know do the discernment and then leave it to a, a few people to look at a draft risk assessment and and sort it out accordingly so i think it's it's making the governance not a, a thing that's divorced from what we do. <laughs> you know, it's about the way we organise ourselves so that we can worship, so that we can witness in the world. Thank you, Barbara. And we can unity as well. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's a lovely comment here from Beth saying, read the colour of the carpet. God doesn't worry about the colour of the carpet. God worries about how we treat each other while we make the decision and that thank you that's Beth. a good piece <laughs> yes thank you um jane mace has suggested um the clerk has can have a strategy of saying the matter is before the meeting to encourage the whole meeting to do some listening that's another helpful one um uh, she also says i have some concern that right ordering and quaker practices and processes seem to be shared through conversation and historically established ways. But then that can mean that it's possible for things to be asserted as this is proper Quaker process in ways that disempower others from querying things or even taking part. So I wonder what you think about, you know, that, that sort of exclusive Quaker behaviour we can slip into if we're not careful. Or excluding, I think I mean, rather than exclusive. It can be very, very discouraging. I remember um, when I was very young in my Quaker journey, um, I had a ministry of the biscuits. I used to make homemade cookies. I still do for lots of situations. I used to make homemade biscuits. And uh, for one meeting, I produced um, some rather special ones with chocolate chip and chopped nuts and um, yeah, a bit special and I can remember the way I felt when someone said oh these aren't very quakery biscuits you know this and it's when that sort of thing happens it's a failure in love you know it's insisting on the letter you know, okay, perhaps digestive biscuits would have been more worthy and Quakerly, I don't know. But I had produced them as my gift to the meeting and it was rejected. Now, that is a good example of how you alienate people and how you send them away. Now, I'm a stubborn woman because I'm still here. But, um, you know, um, it's so easy to insist on the letter. And there's a good reason for people understanding how the discipline works, but it shouldn't be used as a weapon to beat people about the head with. Um, 
or to disempower them or to encourage them. There's a way of saying to people, she could have said, this person who spoke to me, oh, these are rather posh biscuits. We usually have much plainer biscuits than that. <laughs> and that would have been, a, she was observing the same thing, but she was not making me, she wouldn't have made me feel the same way. And this remembering to speak with love and remember that it's so easy to speak a hurtful word and the consequences can be very long lived people and this you know insisting on and i'm passionate don't get me wrong i am passionate about the, the quaker discipline as in embodied in the way that we conduct our business absolutely passionate about it because it is a brilliant brilliant tool in our hands um, but we need to encourage people to understand why we do it like that so that they can share, so that they can be part of things and not feel that there's some mysterious Quakerly stuff which they don't understand and which they're getting wrong. I don't think I've got anything to add to that. I think it, it and I think it's welcoming uh, people's contributions and, and I think one of the things is modelling it. And I, in Simon Risley's um, article, he talks about, uh, you know, two well-established friends in yearly meeting that behaved in a way that um, didn't feel, you know, the right, you know, and it, often you kind of feel, oh, you know, they can speak twice in a meeting, but, you know, little me, um, you know, pops my head up and says one thing and then pounced on, you know, and, and I think it's that... Um, you know, so we're, we are a community and that's it's part of the whole thing is it's about building community. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, community to be Quakers. You know, it's not just community for its, itself. It's, you know, to be a worshipping community, but also, of course, to act in the world. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the minute from junior yearly meeting that's quoted in the epistle that talks about streamlining our business processes. You know, because I, 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 I think that trying to get, you know, that, that if you like, we can waste so much time <laughs> doing business together and I don't think it is wasted time if it's done efficiently and well and prepared for um you know but I think that um uh, you know I, I think we need to do it so that it it enables us uh, to be better uh, uh, better Quakers in every different sense um and, and uh, you know uh, uh, embodying it in our business process there are some lovely comments actually in the chat after what you both just said, uh, where Matt Moore has said, I think in response to you really, Judith, that the letter killeth. It is the spirit and not the I, form I, that I, ultimately I matters. Hear, I couldn't hear oh, that. Sorry. Yeah. If, uh, so a comment in the chat from Matt Moore mm -hmm. says, the letter killeth. It is the spirit and not the form that ultimately matters. He also notes, special biscuits are always good. <laughs> and we have some people saying that friend speaks my mind below. So <laughs> I think we would have been very happy to have your biscuits do this. <laughs> I, I, there's, a, there's a sort of technical question here that's come in. It says because of increasing legislation and the development of larger governance groupings of friends, e.g. in Wales and London, we are employing more staff who will be part of the governance meetings but have to accept the decisions of trustees, which they may agree with. How do we make clear where authority lies? Yeah, I think that's, a, I mean, I think it's a very good question. Um, as somebody who is a trustee of Meeting of Friends in Wales, who employs a uh, uh, an administrator um, who doesn't normally come to our trust trustee meetings, but occasionally we do ask her because, um, you know, if there's something that's, that seems to have a, her specific uh, expertise needed. Um, and um, recently, and I think it's, you know, I talked about different types of meetings and how you can do discernment. And, and I know that lots of people are, are, are practiced at this. Um, in Wales, we've, um, we advocate um, 
for Quakers in Wales, you know, and we need a voice to do that. And we need a process. And we've had a little group that's been called the focus group that has been deciding, you know, what we should be focusing on right now, but is also, um, you know, should a consultation come up uh, that we feel that it needs a Quaker voice, they would be the group that would put it together. Um, but that the process would be that the clerks um, would sign it off, having consulted with anybody who, you know, might be relevant to that particular thing. So, and and in we we had a, 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 a sort of open to everybody meeting called refocusing the focus group, you know, which anything could have happened. But it was quite interesting how uh, people did raise where is the authority? And I think it's that thing that, you know, we've got a group that's that's working and is passionate about peace education. You know, they work, you know, so that they would definitely be the experts that we would go to, but that we wouldn't, you know, they are not empowered to make a statement, um, you know, without, if you like, the authority of the clerks of, of making sure that it's been checked out um, there and doesn't and you know with, with something like that we would obviously consult with people um, in Britain in any meeting who were experts you know it's kind of where is the authority what can we speak on with authority so that's a particular type of authority but I think authority and accountability is an important important factor um, and I think yeah that's probably is um, Yes, and, and a lot of Quakers react very badly to this word authority because in the secular world it has overtones of somebody um, having power over you in ways that you don't particularly like. And our authority comes from somewhere else. Ultimately, it comes from the guidance we receive from the Spirit in our gathered meetings for worship. And that's where the authority comes from, the power to, to do things. I think the other thing that helps people is if there is clarity about the roles. So that if the role of the meeting is clear, if the role of the trustees supporting that meeting is clear, if the staff roles are clear, you are much less likely to have uh, difficulties. And I say much less likely, there's always, going to be, <laughs> there's always going to be difficulties, especially if one's trying to move things and change things um, in ways that hopefully will allow us to um, streamline our processes. I quite like that. I think that's better rather than talking about simplification because we need to be careful um, you can change all the structures and all the scaffolding and quite a lot of the governance arrangements, but there's a core of things which you need to keep. Um, and an understanding of how things work and who is responsible for what is really very helpful if you can, ach if you can achieve it. Um, it comes down again, I mean, Deborah made the point earlier in our conversation, it comes down to communication, um, which is a very tricky beast, isn't it? Um, you tend to assume that because you've told somebody something, they have heard it and they've understood it. Um, it ain't so. I mean, my husband and I have been married for over 50 years and amazingly, we still have failures of communication. <laughs> my <doctor. laughs> Um, because of assumptions, experience, you know, people are different. Um, and we, we just need to be aware of, uh, of that as we're, we're dealing with, with um, things that communication, if you could solve that, you could make a fortune. <laughs> I reckon <laughs> Quakers need never worry about financing any ever again. Um, it needs constant work and a lot of it as we said earlier on comes back to trust you know if we trust the spirit if we trust each other's discernment if we trust each other's goodwill we'll still perhaps make mistakes but we shan't make such gross mistakes possibly and we shan't have so many uh, really intractable difficulties and i'm not minimizing how hard that is but that would be 
my recipe, if you like, for how to strengthen your community, how to move forward, how to do governance, how to include people. Um, yes, that's enough. <laughs> Thank you. I think um, it's, it's reminding me of our ability or not to let go and let committees get on with a piece of work that they have been tasked to do. And you know, how much checking in and checking up do we want to do? Because that always seems to me quite frustrating and, and time consuming. So how do you get the balance right on that? And Oliver Waterhouse is suggesting some real creativity in our nominations processes that might enable Quaker communities to simplify and to consider the structures we need for the society to flourish. Mm. I, and I guess, you know, that's a question we ask ourselves quite a lot. I sit on a nominations committee. We ask ourselves a lot, I can assure you. <laughs> How do you find people to do jobs is one question, but actually the, job, the question before that is, do we need this job doing? Mm. Because, you know, just because we've always done it, yeah. Deborah. Well, and does it need doing it in that way? I mean, certainly, um, you know, when I was saying that I've been involved in all these governance meetings, I had different roles in different ones. But one of the ways that in South Wales, um, we've got three, we've got a clerking team of three. And it does seem, you know, and that's, although it, <laughs> it, it's sort of, if you like, increasing the appointments, it means that actually, um, you know, it, it, I could do that and other things because I'm not doing, if I was just a single mm. area meeting clerk, you know, there's no way I could do any other Quaker job at all, I don't think. But being one of three, um, you know, means that I can, I, you know, and then of course, we're bringing the experience from other jobs as well. So I think that thing of thinking creatively, not mm. just about whether a job needs doing, but how it need how it can be done, um, if it does need doing, um, you know, because I think that it, it, certainly asking for volunteers under something is, and in a way, it goes back to accountability and authority. Is this a task for which you need accountability? You know, does, you know, so one of the vexed questions that we discussed yesterday was whether to have flowers in the middle of the table, you know, whether we needed to appoint somebody to bring the flowers. <laughs> we decided no. If anybody <laughs> wanted to bring flowers, they could. And if there were no flowers, that would be fine, mm. you know, and maybe somebody would go out and pick a bit of the hedge and stick that on the on the table if they fancied it. But it didn't matter. I mean, it ended up that actually two of us brought flowers yesterday, you know, because I suddenly thought, oh, I would like it if there were some flowers there. I'll just pick some. I don't need to be appointed to do it. I'll just do it. And 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 Julia and I laughed at each other, you know, because we both had exactly the same thought. But, the, you know, the more the merrier. It didn't matter. And it doesn't matter either way. So I think that you know there's you don't need an authority to do flowers not in our meeting anyway maybe some other meeting you do <laughs> but i think it's that sort of thing but but you know i'm sure that there would be things where you think yes it, we need to be quite clear that that job is being done is do being done well will report to the next person etc etc mm. um, so i think it's separating out you know what kind of a role it is I think that's helpful. At one meeting I belong to, we stopped having a roast of tea and coffee, which meant for several weeks we had tea and coffee without milk because no one brought the milk. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes just for practical reasons, you do want a rotor mm. or something where people sign up. But, yeah. I mean, I think but, but actually... we learned. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I think maybe sometimes, you know, as you say, governance is all about organizing ourselves and sometimes there are practical things we need to organize and other times it's kind of more big picture things but the whole idea of sort of volunteering to do some jobs and maybe some roles you don't need to worry too much about it and some you do it's kind of reflected in the chat comments actually and um, so Beth Allen has said for example in nominations we can move to asking for volunteers and accept that we may have to be truthful and brave enough to tell people they're not suitable and so again, I think that comes down to communication and trust, two key things that have kept coming up tonight on how do we do good governance. Um, and that's actually been also picked up by uh, Matt Moore. And he suggested that nominations can ask their meeting communities how individuals may feel they might serve and what qualities and skills they might have. So there is something about everyone bringing their own gift um, and seeing how that could be used. And uh, Margaret and Barbara, have said 
Uh, for me, this is about community. When we are welcomed and nurtured and we feel part of a living community, we come to learn that for it to work and we have to help it by offering our talents. So this process of getting people involved in governance goes way back to how our journeys in Quakers start. That so is a very, very good comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that friend very definitely speaks my mind. <laughs> should never despise the small things the odd kind word the odd um little contact all those tiny little things add up i mean if it was good enough for saint Teresa um, of calcutta who said you know i can do no great things but a million small things with great love um mm. that's what it's about it, it's not waiting for the big opportunity to do something it's finding lots of small occasions to include to look after each other to praise to encourage you know e each other that's how it, it works i i love that um is starting the journey you don't start at the governance end you start at the welcoming and nurturing end um and if we get that right we are more likely to find that of organizing ourselves becomes clearer and more obvious and that more people will be willing to give a hand because there's nobody else but us. So um, I'm going to ask a question now about um, you know being and doing Quaker in the world because we've talked quite a bit about growing ourselves as a community that trusts one another and works together and discerns and so that comes through our worship and our church affairs how do we balance the, the time that is consumed in that and the energy and the, the people hours with the ability and the desire to go out and change the world externally? I think I touched on that a little bit that, uh, you know, that if you like, our governance is to enable that. And I think, thankfully, we've got lots of Quakers who are passionate about every issue in the world <laughs> um you know be it environment be it um uh, work with children be it um peace etc etc and i think um so i think it, it the governance is is to enable and and i i would hate that there was any meeting that happened that hadn't got some um, agenda items that enabled us um, to be looking out um, and to be hearing from those people who maybe are active with asylum seekers or whatever. So I think it's um, ensuring that, but, uh, but also, as I've said before, about uh, accountability and authorities, when are these things, um, you know, when do they need um, to, to be you know the Quakers say x y or z you know and and you know we we've had yearly meeting sessions when then we can say something um with some authority or, or and then of course that can be built on in the future so um <laughs> I, I do think that there is certainly a, a, a sort of if you like I'm going to call it horses for courses but you know some people are more uh, if you like, I'm very happy um, in, a, in a business meeting. I feel comfortable there, um, you know, and partly because I've done it, you know, I've <laughs> for a number of years I've been doing it so that there's a, a, you know, I'm in my comfort zone and I'm, I'm less comfortable in every different way um, standing on a street corner with a placard, um, you know, it, my back doesn't stand up very well and, and various other things makes it makes it not such an easy thing for me to do. I've done it in the past and it's not that I don't care about those things. And so I kind of feel that, that uh, uh, quite a lot of governance is enabling the voice to be heard um, and ensuring that there are spaces in which those sorts of discussions can happen, um, you know, and not necessarily in exactly, you know, and the, the, the format of a business meeting isn't necessarily the one that needs to be 
um, working out what needs to happen for asylum seekers. I mean, certainly, you know, for us locally, it, it's nearly always working with others, um, you know, who are working on asylum seekers. And, and of course, you know, as the faith, our faith in the future says, you know, that is part of our witness that we don't say, oh, we've got to do just a Quaker thing on the environment. There's loads of people working on environment. Thank goodness, you know, that we can uh, ally ourselves with with other people who are doing stuff, um, you know, and, uh, and and enable the passion to show through. And I think to it that you can think of you can think of governance as the wind under the wings of those people who want some support in going out and doing active uh, work that looks impressive, but without the bedrock support of our governance and uh, people involved in that, they would not be able, they would not be enabled to do some of the things that they do. And as Deborah says, um, horses for courses, um, I have been known to, to stand in silent vigil on the streets and very uncomfortable I found it to begin with. Um, I'm much happier in organising things. <laughs> um, and both roles are needed and valued, and we shouldn't be saying, I mean, even St. Paul recognised that administration was a spiritual gift. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. Can I just take back to one line, actually, from what you've both been saying, I, I just kept thinking of mine in, at the end of Judith's article, actually, you both talk about sort of governance being an enabling tool. And just at the very last paragraph of Judith's essay, she writes, it is an enabling activity to help Quaker communities to flourish and fulfill their purpose in their worship, work and witness. And I think that really kind of ties it all together, but it, it's about finding whatever gifts you have, whatever you have to offer, whatever your skill set is, you can bring it all to the table and we'll have you know, a very full feast if we all do that. And um, I think we are really close to finishing if we have maybe 30 seconds to think on this really quickly, one final question. Obviously, this um, edition is meant to kind of tie in and help us think about yearly meetings happening later on this year. So what would you both suggest that friends could do in preparation for yearly meetings? And I'll just give you 30 seconds to think about that. Bit of a quick fire one there. Maybe read one, the thing, one thing. Read the papers and remind yourself of why we do things in the way that we do. And that I think would be very good preparation for us all to do. I, I was going to say the same preparation. <laughs> and I think that that idea that, uh, you know, we've it, papers are gradually coming up, but next week there's opportunities to attend um, still some, some sessions, which will build into the, the, the sessions the following weekend. So that's, you know, if people want to, because I think it's preparing, it's that thing of, of mind and heart, you know, and, and it's great that the, in the preparation stuff, there's lots of different ways you can prepare you know, watching videos as well as reading stuff. So, uh, and, and and that actually being together, you know, I'm going to go in person and I'm really looking forward to being with people, which is, you know, just such a joy. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to all the aspects of yearly meeting, um, including the cups of tea. <laughs> and maybe some fancy biscuits. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> so thank you, friends. Thank you, thank you. We've reached our eight o'clock deadline. Um, it's been fantastic having so many thoughts and suggestions coming through on the chat space. Do feel free to write letters into the friend if you feel so minded so that the conversation continues. Also feel free to take some of this inspiration with you into yearly meeting, whether you're attending in person or online. And as our two authors have suggested, preparation is key. <laughs> However you do it, whichever platform, medium, whether you're reading it or watching it on a, a video, preparation. And, and I also heard them say, you know, think about why we do things the way we do, because that is part of our um, significantly different way of doing business quite often. So... Good night, everyone, and thank you very much for your time. And thank you to Judith and Deborah and to co-host Olivia.